Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and as per usual, I'm incredibly belated with my monthly reading wrap-up. One of these days I will actually post a monthly wrap-up at the proper end of the month and I will shock you all. But until then, this is about a month late and oh well. The month of March was a very, very strange month overall. Half of it was normal and going well and then the world turned upside down and the second half was full of anxiety and uncertainty and a complete lack of focus for reading, at least for me. That being said, I read four phenomenal books this month, two of which probably will make my favorites of 2020. The first book I finished in the month of March was How to Be a Tutor by Ruth Goodman. This is the second nonfiction book by Ruth Goodman that I read and it was equally as amazing as How to Be a Victorian. Just like How to Be a Victorian, it takes you through the ordinary lives of people from dawn to dusk. Only this time, Ruth focuses on an era that I know far less about. I know so much about the Victorian period uh, that there wasn't too much new information for me in How to Be a Victorian. Though the way that Ruth Goodman approached the material and presented it was spectacular. I know next to nothing about the Tudor period, so I was delighted to read and learn from this book. Ruth Goodman is an expert historian, and because of her experiences living like a tutor for periods of time, her personal anecdotes add to the subject matter. She brings the same caliber of knowledge to this book as she did to How to Be a Victorian, and she's just brilliant and engaging as a nonfiction author. I can now say that Ruth Goodman is one of my favorite nonfiction authors along with Lucy Worsley. My only major issue with this book was that I had trouble visualizing some of the concepts that were discussed. And that is really my own fault, because I listened to it on audiobook. The print version of this book comes with a compendium of pictures to help you better understand what is described. And I probably should have waited to get my hands on a print version, but instead I fell down the rabbit hole of looking up much of what was mentioned online. Some of the tidbits that I found particularly interesting in this book were the tutor's attitudes towards cleanliness, as well as ale, bread, and just overall nutrition at the time. In the Tudor era, people did not bathe regularly with water. That doesn't mean that they were filthy and smelled horrifically, though. They kept clean by using linen to remove sweat and dirt from their bodies. And surprisingly, Ruth did this for months at a time, and no one was offended by her body odor. And it's also crazy to think about how the concept of privacy didn't exist in the same way that it does today. Whole families and entire households even would share beds. These examples are why I love Ruth's explanations of history so much. They don't just show us what was different way back when, but they help us understand a completely foreign mentality of thinking that comes with the different way of life. And I said it before, but I think that Ruth Goodman's writing is the closest thing that we have to stepping into a time machine and traveling back through history. If you are interested in British social and domestic history or the Tudor time period in general, I cannot recommend Ruth Goodman's work enough. The next book I finished in the month of March was The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow by Natasha Pulley. This book was utterly amazing. It's the direct sequel to Natasha Pulley's first book, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, and it takes place five years after that book does, so it takes place in the late 1880s and it's in Japan. It follows the same main characters as The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, namely Daniel Steepleton and Keita Mori, who both have business in Japan. And there, a series of strange happenings occur People in the British Legion claim to see ghosts, and there are peculiar electric storms, not to mention an abundance of owls. The reader and Thaniel struggle to piece together all of these peculiarities, but meanwhile, Maury seems to know more than he's letting on about the situation, except he can't or won't tell us. The plot of this book is so intricate and so perfect. There are all these disparate pieces that you can't quite figure out, and then suddenly, at the end of the book, things begin to make sense in such an emotional and touching way. This book was utterly brilliant and will probably be one of my top books of the year, and yet 
I feel like my description of this book does not do it justice, but I really can't give it the attention it deserves without spoiling too much about both this book and also The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. And I wouldn't even recommend reading the sequel until you have read The Watchmaker of Filigree Street first. So I will leave the discussion of The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow at that, and instead I will urge you to read The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. I really can't pass up the opportunity to talk about this one. The Watchmaker of Filigree Street takes place in 1883 in London, and it follows Thaniel Steepleton, who discovers a gold pocket watch mysteriously waiting for him on his pillow in his apartment one day. Six months later, this mysterious watch saves his life by directing him away from an explosion that destroys Scotland Yard. Looking for answers, Thaniel tries to find the watch's maker and meets Keita Mori, a peculiar immigrant from Japan. Keita seems harmless, but also seems to be hiding something since he's connected to a chain of bizarre and unexplainable events. Natasha Pulley's books are well-written historical fiction with just the right dose of magic to them, but they also draw on literary traditions found in fantasy and sci-fi. Natasha Pulley has such an extraordinary talent for crafting complicated plots, and she writes in a style that was clearly influenced and inspired by all of my favorite 19th century novelists. She is becoming a favorite author of mine in her own right, and if you like historical fiction or the Victorian time period, you should definitely, definitely read The Watchmaker of Filigree Street first, and then The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow. The third book that I finished in the month of March was Miss Austin by Jill Hornby. Now, I don't want to discuss this book in too much detail here because I've already done an in-depth review of this book in a previous video, and please go check that out if this book sounds remotely interesting to you. I'm rather proud of that review. I think it's one of the better ones I've done, so please do take a look at that. I'll link the review in the description down below. But this book is historical fiction. It centers around Cassandra Austin, who was Jane Austen's sister, confidant, and best friend. We move back and forth between Cassandra as an elderly spinster in the 1840s and her vibrant memories of her youth with Jane. Over 20 years after Jane's death, Cassandra pays a visit to her friend Isabella Fowl. Isabella, a fellow spinster, is forced to pack up her ancestral home of Kintbury Vicarage after her father passes away. Here, Cassandra searches frantically for Jane's letters in the hopes to safeguard Jane's legacy, and she's reminded of her rich past with Jane. The book deals with themes of privacy, family, spinsterhood, legacy, and above all, grief. It was clearly written for Jane Austen lovers by a Jane Austen lover, and it is full of respect and admiration for Jane Austen's work. It's a phenomenal book with such a subtle plot and impeccable characterization. It's beautifully done, and if you're a fan of historical fiction or just love Jane Austen, I can't recommend this book enough. And last but not least, the final book I read in the month of March was Nevermore, The Trials of Morrigan Crow by Jessica Townsend. Nevermore has been making the rounds on booktube lately, but I'll give a brief synopsis anyway. It's about a cursed girl named Morrigan Crow who is fated to die at midnight on her 11th birthday, but miraculously she cheats death and finds herself in a magical world where she is thrust into a competition for a spot in the prestigious, wondrous society. She has to compete in four difficult and dangerous trials against hundreds of others, the last of which is a talent competition where each competitor must dazzle the judges with an extraordinary talent that will ensure them a spot in the organization. Only, Morrigan doesn't know why she's been chosen for this competition or what her talent could possibly be. She only knows that if she does not earn herself a spot in the Wondrous Society, she will have to leave Nevermore and face her deadly fate. This book is a fast-paced, plot-heavy start to a middle-grade series. Jessica Townsend has created a fantastic world that operates so differently from our own, and she introduces us to a cast of unforgettable characters, including the eccentric Jupiter North, Fenestra the giant cat and housekeeper at the Hotel Deucalion, 
She's this snarky, competitive, but also fiercely loyal creature. Nevermore is such a fun and captivating read, and it's only the start to what is promised to be a long and eventful middle grade series. This book left me with so many unanswered questions, and the world and some of its characters didn't feel fully formed yet to me. But it certainly piqued my interest, and I can't wait to see how Jessica Townsend develops what she's started in further books. I will probably start the second book very soon, and we will see how the series progresses. I didn't originally intend to participate in Middle Grade March, and I don't usually read much fantasy, but this is the book that I credit with improving my mood in isolation and giving me the ability to focus on reading again for the month of April. So I highly recommend it if you've been struggling with reading lately. Since reading this book, I have found myself craving fantasy, which is pretty unusual for me. If you've been following my channel, you know that fantasy is not one of the genres I read that frequently but I have found it to be the best genre of escapism in these troubling times. Lately, I have a renewed interest in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series and a sudden desire to read The Name of the Wind and some Robin Hobb books. So don't worry, I'm still reading plenty of my usual genres, classics, historical fiction, all of that good stuff, but I'm just reading a lot more than usual, which is absolutely wonderful. So friends, what have you been reading lately? Do you find that you have a tendency to turn to a certain genre in times of stress, like me with my sudden fantasy cravings? Speaking of which, where would you recommend starting with Robin Hobbs books? I've been wondering this for a while now and I'm not quite sure where to start. I know that the, I believe it's called The Assassin's Apprentice is a place most people recommend or maybe that's just the first book. I'm not sure. Looking for some advice here, please. I hope that you're all doing well and most importantly, staying safe and sane. And until next time, I look forward to seeing you all in another video soon. Bye.